Good morning and welcome to this live debate on advisor technology and specifically its role in assessing client suitability. My name is Scott Sinclair and I'm the editor of Professional Advisor. Are advisors becoming too reliant on technology? Has its rise introduced an element of complacency into the advice process? And are the various tools that advisors use um, too disparate to be of proper use when assessing clients' needs? These are among the topics that will be discussed this morning by our panel, which consists of Chris Pitt, who is Head of Market Analysis at IRS UK. We also have Abraham Okusanya, who is Principal at Finalytic. And last, but by no means least, we have Mark Loosemore, who is an Executive General Manager on the Wealth Side at IRS UK. Now, as I mentioned, this is a live event, so please do contribute. You can ask the panel a question at any point. You should have an Ask a Question tab on your screen. Simply click that and post your question, and it will come through to me here on this supercomputer. Um, likewise, do contribute also to our polls. There should be two going live through the course of the morning, and um, the first one around about now. Um, asking whether firms anticipate spending more or less on technology over the next five years or so. This is also a CPD accreditable event. I will provide you more details about how to claim those points uh, a little bit later on. However, let's get straight into it. Abraham, is technology improving the advice process, yes or no? I think overall, um, individually, the technology tools that advisors use in, in, in the delivery of advice has got better. They got significantly better. So risk profiling tool, um, research tool, back office system, platforms, they've all got better individually and they have improved um, the, the delivery of advice. I think collectively though, because these tools don't really talk to each other um, as, as much as they should, um, integration is still a big issue issue in the industry generally um, and because advisors want to use best of breed technology they might want Finametrica for their for their risk profiling they want IRS for their back office they want FE for their fund research um, <coughs> Uh, and all of these tools might not be talking to each other, which increases the amount of rekeying that advisors have to do, consequently um, increases you know, the, the room for error. So um, yes, technology has improved the delivery of advice, but I think there is still a, a long way to go. A long way to go. Chris, would you agree with that? I, I would certainly agree there is still a long way to go, but I think it's also interesting to look back and see how far we've already come. I think you know the application of technology has enabled the process itself to be delivered far more consistently, accurately. And I'm picking up on your point there about rekeying. I think progress is beginning to be, be made in that area. We are seeing more tools being integrated to each other. And I think we're seeing tools that are becoming more holistic and actually incorporating some of those capabilities. So I would agree there's still perhaps a long way to go, especially I think around the way that actually advisors use them to interact with their clients and that's a, I think a very significant area of development. But I think yes, you know, the tools have made a very significant difference. Sometimes it's we overlook how far we've come. Okay. And Mark, what are your thoughts on this general idea of technology's impact on the advice process? Um, well, first, I think it's interesting to pick up on that integration uh, piece because I think there is no doubt that the tools um, haven't been as integrated in the past. We are seeing that Im improve, but as Chris uh, indicated, the, the breadth of what each tool is doing now tends to increase. So you'll find tools that will not only be the back office but will address the, the research capability, uh, etc. And that has the added benefit that then have one interface, one, one user experience going into that, as well as consistency of data across that. Um, and if we go back, I remember speaking a couple of years ago to an advisor that was using um, a variety of different tools and entering the name and address of a client 21 times during the advice process. 21 times. Yeah, 21 <laughs> times. So you just think that can't be efficient. It can't even be accurate because you build in a, um, a room for, for mistakes. So bringing that onto a single advice platform 
platform or uh, failing that an integrated device platform has to be a, be a benefit. The other th area that I think we mustn't lose sight of that we're getting benefit from is that this isn't just about a one-off advice process. We're now in the world of service, so we're talking about an advice service, and that's an ongoing process. And through technology, I think we can really start to bring forward the right moments to contact the client and give ongoing service, not just take people uh, on that sort of onboarding moment. It's a continuous process that we're looking at now. Okay, thank you. What about this element of complacency. I asked, I did ask a handful of advisors before today whether they felt <coughs> the, the rise of financial services technology, fintech, had introduced the danger of complacency and losing that nuance with the face-to-face -face element with clients. Um, and I wondered sort of what the panel thought of that. Specifically, Chris, what do you think about that element yeah. of complacency? I, th I think it certainly is an important point because uh, as we've introduced more tools which take the, the, the grunt out and the hard work out of doing some of the, uh, the analysis, etc., there is that uh, danger of people becoming, as you say, complacent and just relying on the tool. It becomes a bit of a black box. And so, you know, it almost gets to the situation situation where you could say, well, the computer says that's the answer. And I think where the advisor needs to add value, and I think this is a point that the FCA really stress, is the advisor's got to understand and appreciate how those tools actually work, appreciate what they're doing for that situation, and identify situations where perhaps that's not quite right for this customer circumstance. So I think there is you know, a, a danger, um, but it's also, I think, an opportunity for the advisor to demonstrate the value which they're bringing to that because otherwise why couldn't the customer just use the tool on their own it's that it's that extra level of insight and ability which the advisor brings to the party which I think is the counteract to the complacency but I also think that you know you can have complacency in any industry and yeah. doing an, an, any job but actually if you look at what technology has done in many instances it's actually stretching the level of advice that can be given and, and doing the opposite of complacent I mean how many people were doing cash flow planning yeah. um, f mm -hmm. uh, five years ago. Now, now that you've got c more cash flow planning tools out there, we're now enabling more, more advisors, not just the ones that were great at creating their own spreadsheets, to actually stretch themselves and offer, uh, offer that service. So far from being complacent, I think it's helping people grow their services. So there is always a complacency danger on, on anything, but we shouldn't focus on that. We should look at uh, you know, the added services that are now coming as an advantage. Sure, but it is a concern of the regulator. Roy Purcell yeah. has mentioned it a couple of times. We've heard phrases such as shoehorning from the regulator over the last mm. few years and obviously that is because of the rise of technology sure. in particular centralized inve investment propositions and their role in the advisory business nowadays Abraham what's your thoughts on this I, I, I think with 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 the practice management side of things I don't see much complacency with, with specifically with um, risk profiling mm. and the centralized investment proposition I think there is the danger and I think there is some um, complacency there, but, but uh, and that's because the the way these tools been designed to, um, you know, to um, say for instance take the client through a, a set of questions uh, for for their attitude to risk, and as a result of that produce some sort of asset allocation which then fits, fits them into portfolio five. It does take a bold advisor and a, an advisor who understand what it is that you know. How, how those tools are made, you talked yes. about the idea of black box, to actually question them, you know, to question the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who can feel and touch the client yeah. sitting in front of them, and they're the ones who are able to say, um, I don't think Portfolio 5 fits in this particular instance because X, Y, Z, and to be able to document that. I, and I think that if they're able to, um, you know, go through that thought pattern, understand what the tool does, and 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 um, and document whatever you know tweaks they, they've had to make. Um, I, I think that's perfectly fine. Yes. Um, I, the, the the point though is that um, that should be an exception rather than the rule. You know, what's the point of having a process um, if you keep breaking it and having to you know yes. to go down? A different I think direction. The, the the technology itself is becoming more advanced. So as you're going through and perhaps using. A risk profiling questionnaire 
inconsistencies and extreme answers mm. can be identified mm. and sort of flagged out to the advisor in terms of, you know, this seems slightly odd. So, uh, as I say, the technology itself can aid the, the advisor more and more to, I think, as I say, help with that complacency issue. At the end of the day, it's still that responsibility. Yeah. But I think the tech can get smarter as you and go. Compare that to, again, going back five years ago and talk about the complacent advisor there would actually have five risk descriptions and just say, Mr. Oh. Customer, choose one of those five Absolutely. risk descriptions yes. and that's complacent so at least yeah. um, we're now narrowing the chance of being complacent and you can never completely legislate against it and they absolutely have uh, um, a responsibility to understand the tool uh, to do the due diligence before they select the tool make sure they understand the workings of the tool so they can get to those moments and point out when it's wrong but we mustn't forget that where we were five years ago wasn't that, that was, was worse I, th I think people were, had very loose descriptions yeah. that people were selecting selecting from uh, by almost dropping a pin on a box. Sure. Okay. I'm just going to throw introduce a little sort of side angle to this then. So I think there's complacency but there's also wanting to be safe and secure yeah. with your recommendations. So the technology is helping you do that. But there is a lot of talk with advisors at the moment about how the, the ombudsman would determine a case. And you were saying, Abraham, about making sure you properly document any tweaks you might make to the recommendation mm. the tool makes. But some advisors, for, for some advisors, this is just very common sense. You know, they clearly document it. They're very secure. If there were ever to be a complaint that this is how they documented it and this is how it was agreed. But there is some concern with how the regulator and the ombudsman would would, yeah, would judge that advice. Yes. So is technology maybe making things introducing that problem of wanting to be safe? So if I do what the the tool recommends, mm -hmm. then I've got a, a much cleaner argument in the future. As if I make some tweaks, yes. there's, there are more questions for I, I think, as, as Mark says, you know, and looking back, we've come an awful long way improving the, the quality of the documentation and the evidence. I think we're almost now sort of nudging into into the world where the FCA, the FOIS, etc., are saying, but did the customer actually understand the advice that was being given? So we've come a huge long way, and you know, the technology has been great for that. And I think where we need to travel a bit further is around that financial capability really? piece and understanding I've documented everything correct, it's a great solution, but the FUS would say, but the customer clearly didn't understand it. And I think that's where if we can get into perhaps just another level of checking, questioning, etc., to make sure that the customer did understand and that's recorded, then I think that takes us another step forward. So this really is about documentation and making sure the record keeping is tight. Um, to what extent has fintech impacted on individual product selection or solution selection for a client? And what are the safeguards? So that we've obviously always slightly touched on this issue so far, but Abraham, what are your thoughts on the direct impact technology has had on selecting an end product for a client who needs one? I, I, I think, again, that's, that, that has improved. Um, we've moved away, I hope, um, from a world where product providers were um, fiddling around with risk profiling tool to, to get a certain outcome or to fit their own um, investment proposition. Advisors have recognized um, that they need to use independent research tools for, for, for their product research and selection. Um, you know, so it, it, it has got better. There are still areas where you, you need um, you need some improvement, but we're, we're beginning to see signs of, so say for instance, things like DFM selection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th there's still a lot, you know, a, a lot of room for um, I improvement there, um, but overall, it, it has improved. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Mark, what, what do you think are the, the safeguards here when it comes to selecting, using technology to select a solution? What are the safeguards advisors need to ensure they're putting in place? Um, well, I think a lot of the systems enable now people to put their own safeguards in. Certainly for the, for the larger firms can have centralized teams that can build in safeguards. Um, I think also within the solutions you can um, now have uh, checkpoints. Um, you can build in compliance checks as you go through a process. You've also got uh, you know, sophisticated case checking systems now that are, used to be available just to the large banks and building societies being available for people to use in much smaller businesses as well. So I think there's all sorts of ways that technology can start building in business rules to check that things are appropriate. 
All right, Chris, did you have anything to add? Yeah, it's just it triggered a thought there around um, behavioural economics. I think that's right. something that we're really starting to uh, get to grips and understand. It's not only the way that technology pr presents um, and the, the number of solutions and filtering them, it's how they are presented. I mean, the behavioural economics shows that if you give a, a customer a, a choice of 2,000 funds, they get confused. We need to present the choices to, to consumers, to advisors, et cetera, in a, in a way that they feel comfortable and happy making the, those choices and the right choices. So I think the behavioral economics piece, I've seen one uh, smashing example where uh, the same choice of eight funds was presented on one screen and then split over two screens and the selection of funds was remarkably different simply by the implication that because the funds on the second page were on the second page they must be not so good as the ones on the first page for some reason absolutely not true but it just shows you that the power that exists in the way that we actually present a choice and i think that's something that we are in the financial services industry just starting to appreciate. I think other industries have appreciated it for a, a lot longer. It was the FCA's first paper on behavioural economics, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do. I do think that again, we're talking generically here. There are still very specific examples of of bad bad practices going on. Um, we still have. We're still in a world where if you um, you know if you um, need um, to to do a cost comparison. On, on pension products, you still have to request paper illustration okay. from the provider, and you take that data, you put it in some sort of tool, um, and and then you 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 you, you, do, you do the research on that. I still find errors occasionally in the in the calculations where, where it doesn't add up. So um, overall, it's improved, but this is not where we need to be in in 2015. Okay, all right. Did you want to add anything to that, Mark? Um, well, just making sure that we also take that through to how we communicate anything, not just in the questions, but any of the outputs towards the clients as, as well. I think people consume information in different ways. So if mm -hmm. we think about how uh, taking this to how we then interact with the end clients and the reports that we produce out there, people need things a lot more concise these days. They can take information from multiple sources, but little snippets uh, everywhere. You know, the social media has taught us to behave in that way, um, and uh, I think that's going to get stronger and stronger as the generations move through that from school now through to the financial okay. well, world. I, th I think you're seeing that with the um, pension passport initiative which you know is just starting to, to, to happen you know reducing what was a, a wake up pension wake up pack which was 30 plus yeah. pages mm -hmm. down to you know at least one single sheet which is common across the industry and using standard yeah. identifiers I think you know as an industry we perhaps need to sort of stand back and say we need to do a bit of standardization to help the end consumer to help advisors etc so let's all start using the same ter terminology at least yep. and you know if we can get things down and put it onto one piece of paper there's a chance consumers might actually do something with it and okay. maybe that would be leaving them to take advice uh, and maybe god forbid we get some engagement you know just yep. think of just think of pension illustrations rather than mid as uh, a so low low mid um, high growth maybe we'll get to a point where you'd afford um, some medium-sized car and, and Lamborghini and, and something that actually gives people an idea of what, what we're talking about. I think there's some great examples in the US where people are presenting data and engaging with clients using gaming or using far more graphical interfaces that we really, really haven't touched on in this the, 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 sure. this country yet um, and, I th and I think we really need to learn that engagement piece uh, and that's going to get more and more important as, as the younger generations move yes. through. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier about the FCA having its say about advisors' use of technology and third-party tools in particular. Uh, we have a slide on this for our uh, viewers, which should be going live now, if not very shortly. Um, the FCA has set out its expectations. They are abbreviated on this slide that it must be suitable for use with your customer base. Obviously, that sounds like common sense, the FCA has to say it. Um, understand how the tool works, particularly where investment selections are made have a robust process to mitigate shortcomings or limitations of the tool. I have abbreviated these, but this brings us me on to the next thing I wanted to ask you, which was about the things that technology that we're using today can miss. So 
is sufficient allowance made for things such as longevity, which is becoming very, very important part of the conversation, not least as part of the retirement reforms? Um, so, Chris, I just wanted to ask you about about this issue, uh, about technology missing vital points. Yes, yeah, yeah. I suppose it's perhaps because an industry we've been very focused on the accumulation phase, and you know, and when we were in the decumulation, well, the answer was an annuity by and large, and it was really a question of well, which company do you buy it from? Since the reforms, that's changed quite remarkably. So there, there has been a sort of a more emphasis on the, well, let's talk about retirement now because I've got some options. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, longevity, as you say, people are more interested in that personally. So, uh, you know, all the research shows that people underestimate how long they are going to live. And I think that's quite an education point, which I think, you know, there are now technology solutions becoming available to help people understand, well, you know, okay, Mr. Client, actually, you think you're going to live for another 20 years. The statistics show that it's probably nearer 30. And I think that's, you know, okay. really just part of the uh, opening up of the conversation around, around pensions freedoms. Okay, and um, Abraham, would you like to I think this? the tools are certainly out there to model possible outcomes um, as to whether advisors are using them um, is um, is a question. You know, it's a, it's a big it's a big question. Okay, Mark, anything to add? I, I think it's the human dimension ultimately that, that is, you've got to be careful you don't skip out because while you can get uh, a result from a computer, actually eyeballing the client and seeing how they're reacting to, to that result. So particularly like discussing risk profiling, a, a, a lot of the value from the from that comes with the discussion about the, the, that risk profile afterwards, so that you make sure that the client understands uh, what the results are. Unless you're in front of the client, and you can see the body language, you can understand how they interact, I think you can miss that. I think even when you're then talking about uh, fact-finding and uh, gaining goals information, a lot of people talk about doing that online, which is something I fully support, but when you're then talking about goals, seeing the human dimension of how someone's eyes light up when they're talking mm -hmm. about saving up for a particular, I mean, their mm -hmm. the Ferrari or whatever it is, that, that, that is the one thing that they're really driven by, and picking up that human dimension is something that sure. the computer is never go going to don't going to get so I don't think we should ever forget the human part, um, particularly when we're doing complex financial advice. And I think you, you mentioned there on risk profiling, and I think obviously for in, in the decumulation phase, risks are different, mm -hmm. and, and actually, I think you know having a, a different sort of conversation and pointing out the, the different risks that there are, and obviously taking money out, you know, pound costs averaging works the other way around, and becomes a more significant risk. So I think it is very important that you know don't pretend well we had the risk profiling I know what risk attitude you've got mm -hmm. I think there's uh, a need and a, and, and a value for having that another conversation and it's very important that you have that one okay thank you we've got some results from uh, the first poll that we ran so the question was whether um, you envisage your business spending more on technology or less over the next five years um, it won't surprise you I'm sure it doesn't surprise me that the vast majority 87.2 percent of um, viewers have said they do intend to spend more um, so now we are going to put our next poll live on the um, on the page, which we'll deal with a little bit at the end of this session. It's about robo-advice. Is the rise of robo-advice a threat op or an opportunity for your business? So we will tackle that at the end. I'm sure you all want to have your say about that. Um, we touched upon a little bit about risk descriptions. I have had a question about this, which I will ask um, after this. Um, but. Phrases such as capacity for loss, I mean, attitude to risk versus capacity for loss is a very clear difference between the two, but they're often used interchangeably. Um, and capacity for loss is something that the FCA has flagged very recently, I think this year, as something that's still not quite done um, adequately. Um, so I wanted to ask you about phrases like capacity for loss and the risk descriptions in general. Are they adequate in 2015? Do customers really understand them? And how are advisors, how can advisors ensure that clients can really understand what they mean? So Chris, if I could come yeah. to you with that one. Okay, um, I mean the answer is, is very simple in terms of it's yes and no, because actually as 
as consumers, we're, we're all different. And I think the key challenge for the, the advisor is, is to recognize the, the financial capability of the person sitting in front of them. There'll be plenty of customers for whom you know, capacity for loss is absolutely fine, the right terminology, they understand it perfectly and can have a sensible discussion. There'll be others for whom capacity for loss means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's then the advisor's you know, role to actually explain that in terms that that individual customer will understand. So you know, I, d I don't think whatever terminology we, we come up with and say that's the definition, that's not the answer. It's really understanding the person in front of you and tailoring your communication. And opinion. it depends who the target is for that, that terminology because yeah. um, if it's an end consumer, I'm not sure capacity loss is ever the best <laughs> phrase, to be honest. Um, I mean, how much can you lose? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. um, there's a clear, if we're trying to get the industry to discuss it, then, then, then maybe. Um, so, um, but I think that the risk descriptions go further than that. I still see poor examples of risk definitions that are, are using words like some risk or stuff that you can't quite quantify sure. and deal with that. And the fact that the FCA is still talking about this um, and has been for many, many years, it clearly isn't adequate because we haven't solved this problem. Um, we have various tools that can help people through that discussion point, but I think we're still confusing the end yes. client. Well, I, I think to the first question, um, the risk descriptions, do they go far enough? No. Um, the FCA doesn't know doesn't understand how to 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 to, to measure capacity for loss, it's a very difficult thing to measure by, you know, just by the definition. I've never seen or read or or heard any FCA piece that says, here's an uh, example of how you measure client's capacity for loss. It's by its very nature, it's it's very difficult to measure. Um, um, and even the risk, if you go back to the point about risk description, there are some that have gone um, a bit further um, to try and explain what it means so it would say something like say in medium risk you could have um, you know um, a higher proportion of growth assets um, and, and less of defensive something like that but what does that mean to an ordinary person mm -hmm. I've seen a risk description mm -hmm. that that includes um, the the maximum loss in, 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 in any one year over say 40 year period and 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 the maximum gain over for any one year to, to to try and give the client some sort of um, some sort of idea of possible losses and gains within their portfolio, but actually when you think about it and you think, well, what is the real impact on that on a client if that. If they see the worst case, that worst case scenario, on the eve of their retirement, mm -hmm. it's a completely different conversation mm -hmm. and different impact from if that event happens, say, um, you know, later in life, when, when you know, when they, they, they're far more relaxed with yep. with, with expenditure and uh, and and got lo they, they've got le less to, to less um, time to live. So mm -hmm. the, the point is by its very very definition, risk capacity is a very hard thing to measure. Um, there are stochastic models out there yeah. that, that models different outcomes. We don't do enough, I don't think, in trying to help client visualize that. Right. Um, yeah. Risk profiling tools, I feel free to tell me to shut up, uh, but <laughs> risk profile, uh, sorry, um, cash flow modeling tools are, are great um, and useful in helping clients visualize their expenses in retirement, but in in deciding the path that their portfolio is probably going to take, I think it's it's you know it, yeah. it fosters an illusion of of um, uh, of certainty that clearly it doesn't exist in real world. I think, I think you make a, a great great point there about visualization. Oh, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's sometimes I think you know as an industry we perhaps get a little too hung up on you know the definition a series of words. Etc. But I think you know, as, as Mark and yourself were talking earlier on, we need to bring that to life to, for, for people to actually understand, and we need to you know vis bring it to life.
life in visual terms. And people obviously understand the concepts, you know, they're probably quite happy to, to go down to the bookies and place bets, etc. So they understand some of those concepts. It's when we put it into a financial context and perhaps surround it with jargon that they're not familiar with that sometimes they get bored and not interested. It's our role to bring that to life for them and perhaps, you know, maybe it's through sort of gaming techniques, etc., yeah. mm -hmm. that you can actually start to, you know, get it across to people. Oh, yeah, I understand what you mean now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And the, fundamentally, though, it's about a discussion about it, isn't it? So you need the pic pictures there to help it and, and to, to, to leave people, but you've got to have that discussion with them. And that comes back to the human dimension. You've got, you've got mm. to make sure that they understand it. Um, and, and, and again, something maybe that if it's completely automated that you miss is that slight confused look in the eye. So you need to be able to talk, <laughs> yeah. talk people through the, 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 uh, the outputs and, and give that clear verbal explanation as Absolutely, well. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're talking about bringing, bringing it to life for customers. We have had a question in from Alan Brown for the panel. He asks, what are your opinions in relation to using WebRTC to communicate with customers, speaking to them through their their browser? Are you familiar with this particular I was going tool? to say what it has is, <laughs> is yeah. WebRTC. I'm not sure, but I think the, the, the wider point about speaking to customers through a browser using sort of yes. modern technology yeah, to yeah, communicate yeah, yeah. Yeah. is an important thing. I mean, how important would that be going forward? Well, I, I, I think uh, um, using different communication techniques to uh, to make um, advice more efficient by not having to travel out all the time is really important. So um, Iris um, originated in Australia, and, and, and uh, we had clients out there that we were, you know, out in the remote mines, and the advisors would be uh, in a centre, say in Perth, didn't want to travel all, all that way uh, out to see them. So they were using uh, techniques to sh share screens, to show modelling, um, uh, maybe just even video conferencing to be able to. Um, but that's to keep the human interface on, on, on as well. I think if it's pure sort of discussions type stuff, that still works for some people, but I'm not sure for financial services in terms of the advice part, you can get enough just from typing in. I think it has to be a visual face-to-face, -face, uh, -face ideally. Um, but you'll see more and more, especially as we try and take advice to the mass market mm. um, uh, and who maybe aren't prepared to pay the fees of a face-to-face -face someone coming out and seeing them. I, and I, I think, think you important. see, I mean, you know, the millennial generation, they do everything that way. I mean, and, and we should just accept that is the, uh, is the way that communication will be, d will be done. It's just another form of communication. Sure. Why should we necessarily, as you say, Mark, have to travel to talk to people face-to-face? -face? And it's not just a geographical distance. We actually found when uh, in Australia, Australia, that the, the people that were started using that technology may have been the people in remote journeys. But where it got used most was in places like Sydney, where really busy people weren't prepared to get up and go to see someone. Uh, they wanted to talk to someone in their lunch break. I've got half an hour now. I'm going to mm. um, connect um, in, in the city to that way. So it's not just about travelling distance. It is about efficiency of, of advice sometimes. And, and so uh, okay. I'm sure it will take more and more. You know, people say things. Uh, First of all, I'm going to add what, what Mark said, <laughs> you know, okay, yeah. uh, but, but people say things all the time and they, you know, when they talk about technology and communication, co communicating with clients, they think, oh yeah, the younger clients, the millennials, you know, people like me rather than Mark. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> but, um, but I, I think, again, that's, um, you know, that's, um, you know that that's not true. You know my you know my my, my parents are getting on a bit now. They talk to their granddaughter on on mo yeah. you know mobile yeah, apps yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. on um, um, you know Skype iPad thing yeah, and yeah. Skype and all that. So so older people mm. um, are okay with technology because they're using it with their grandchildren and, and, and their children. Yeah. And so um, this is something that cuts across I, generations. I think yes, you're, you're right. You know the typical you know profile of a, a platform user, you know, direct to consumer platform user is actually a retired colonel in Surrey, actually. So it is people with time and the money and, and actually sort of age, as, as you say, people are, of all ages, are pretty comfortable with the yeah. technology. I just sort of make the point that actually even the younger generation, that's all that they use as well. We have to get you know, very, very familiar and comfortable with the fact that it's almost technology first.
Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you you ring a teenager, they they don't want to speak to you. They just say, why don't you just text me? Or, <laughs> yeah. Or, you yeah. Know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think the, the other dimension to this, though, is I think what they do expect is to be able to use those different communication channels as and when they want. So if you just focus yes. on web and you forget the face to face, I think you miss a trick. So yes. what you need is to, your client to be able to contact you without you being there uh, and just look something up, uh, get maybe the valuation online. Okay. Uh, for you, then be able to phone you up and get a consistent answer and then ask for you to come around and see them the next day and for you to still have the same service level, same answers, same data in, in front of you. And it's, we need to be able to communicate with the clients the way they want to, when they want to. Okay, I think some uh, viewers are waiting for us to talk about risk profiling, okay. so we'll move on to this next. Okay. We have had a question in from a Chris Tuck who asks, isn't there a danger that clients may misinterpret questions on a risk profile tool and result in an unreliable assessment. He says, does the panel consider it essential that the advisor educates and supports the client so they can answer a questionnaire reliably? And Chris, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that. I mean, having looked through some of the, the, the questionnaires, as I say, it comes back down to that financial capability of the person in, in front of you. There'll be some consumers where absolutely I think you should sit down and walk through the risk profiling questionnaire with them to make sure that they understand the questions, because some of them can be written in terminology which can appear a, a little bit jargon. And I think, as, as I think Mark, you said, you know, sometimes you have to be spot uh, sitting with a client and spotting when you know the glaze comes over the eyes and yes I think there is a need for you to to sit with that's the value you're adding as as an advisor if you're doing things certainly face to face yeah I'm not sure I, I completely agree I've, I have heard advisors say things like they don't want to influence the mm. clients um, um, uh, um, <clears throat> Ha, you know the, the clients in, their answers their, yeah. Their, yeah. Their, their answers I've also seen behavior or going back to behavior of finance and um, that says that when you're sitting in front of two client male and female client mm -hmm. and you start to explain the market to them the male client just wants the, the, some macho uh, there's some macho there yeah. they want to demonstrate their skills and impress <laughs> the advisor and yeah. so they, they are far more likely are far more likely to influence the the, the, the response and, and many advisors that I know say we give the the, the, the risk profiling mm. tool to the client to take away and, and complete um, but the point I wanted to make this goes back to us as an industry a key um, point about when you choose a risk profiling tool is that it shouldn't be gobbly to go, it should say it, sh it should be simple enough for a layman to to understand and if it doesn't um, you probably should think mm. twice about it. I, I think that's, <laughs> that's a great point and, and I think some people like Morningstar have made a, a, a key point to get you know the, the plain English type um, uh, sign off on the questions that they're asking I think we've also got to trust that a number of these uh, tools uh, have benchmarked their output so that they check that they're consistently getting the, the response that you want. And then the final point is the output then is just a start of a discussion. Mm -hmm. If we're going to take that output and we're not going to have a discussion with it, then maybe we've got some issues. But if we're taking that output and then we're validating that through the discussion with the client, we're illustrate using some of the yeah. stochastic modeling to create graphs and uh, explain the risk and then we're validating it, then I think it, it it's far better. I think also bear in mind that some of these tools now have consistency type algorithms within them so it will flag up how reliable the results are as well. So the tools are getting a lot better but at the end of the day um, the, the, the viewer is right there's a responsibility I think at that point to bring in the questioning uh, and, and checking. Uh, I'm not sure whether you want to bring it during the questionnaire because that can bias the output. I see okay so it's up for because um, <coughs> advisors use there are quite a few risk profiling tools out there when you add them all up. Um, advisors don't all use one or two. There seems to be quite a spread from what I've from what I found. I've also heard that none of them are perfect. So um, <laughs> there's even a bit of a, a combination. Yeah. Um, there are some very well-respected tools out there. Um, Abraham, what's your experience of 
of this when you're working with advisory businesses is it are you are you finding that advisors have any concerns about risk profilers or I think advisors have recognized that as, as Mark said it's it's just really for the most part a discussion tool to start a conversation with with the client to identify incons inconsistencies and uh, and talk to the client um, so um, I, I think there is the recognition that it is it is just a a, a, dis a useful, a very useful discussion tool with the clients. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to move on to our next question, which is about the retirement reforms. I thought we should um, cover that, if only briefly. Um, what have the reforms, which are obviously very sort of far-reaching, um, meant for assessing suitability? And Mark, can I ask you? The pension reforms absolutely yep. huge impact on the industry, yeah, yeah. but what does it what does it mean for advisors when they're now talking to clients on, in their first well, at instance? That point, you've then got far more choice than you had before, so therefore you have to assess the different um, options available to the client and make sure that you're uh, presenting the the best routes forward for them. Um, I think it gives emphasis on uh, having the right discussions uh, with the client to understand what their goals are. Um, real emphasis on risk now at that point, whereas maybe that wasn't that focused before uh, and then using the tools to help those discussions again and I think it's really interesting to see the, the variety of tools coming out at the moment um, uh, re recently judging some awards um, for innovation and the vast majority of the innovation is around this area trying to create tools to communicate very clearly to, to the end uh, communicate the concept of risk communicate so the concept of risk but also can communicate um, if you take uh, the money in this way your tax implications are X, you know, and coming up with financial strategies rather than flogging a product. So, uh, you know, and, and, and doing that pictorially. Sure, okay. I think, yeah, I think this is sort of a classic example where there is a need to focus on what exactly the consumer actually needs and wants. So forget about individual solutions and products, etc., and work out well, what is it that you need? You know, do you need lump sum? Do you need guaranteed retirement income, etc.? Sure. And once you, you understand that, then you can start to look at what, what the products are. And maybe, you know, because we've gone through a situation where annuity seems to have gone into a, a you know, a stage where you know, that's a terribly bad thing. Nobody wants an annuity. Don't touch it with a barge pole. But if you come at it through a series of questions saying, what is it that you really need in terms of the shape? Sure. Then actually you might come and say, well, actually annuity is an important part of that solution. So I think it's really important that you understand. Uh, and I think, you know, suitability is, you know, is absolutely, you know, key to make sure you understand, you know, client requirements and then match accordingly to it. Okay. I think pension reform has set the bars quite high as far as um, getting to the point where you're comfortable that um, you know that the outcome is, is suitable for the client. And um, I'm not sure. From talking to advisor, uh, we were still having conversation. We're still having conversation on Twitter with advisors around sequencing risk and how you sure. model that. I'm not sure that. I have, you know, I'm not sure that ev we, we've all got to the point where we're totally comfortable. We understand all the risks, and and we're able to talk, we'll talk less of, you know, able to talk to clients about it. I think it's it's um, in a, it's an incredibly challenging terrain. Mm. Um, but okay. you know, advisors and the industry generally are, you know, resourceful, and and I'm sure we'll 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 learn as we go along. Okay. Mm. Um, I suppose we want to close a little bit by talking about the, the future of financial advice and the role of technology. This does bring us on um, to the topic of robo-advice. We have run a poll. I can give you those results now. Most viewers do see robo-advice as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, Though it's not such a big difference to the first poll, 36% do see robo-advice as a threat to their business. Um, so I wanted to ask what the panel thought specifically. I mean, we may very well deal with robo advice at a future um, event, but what are your sort of overall thoughts on this, Abraham? How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think that for the vast majority of advisors, robo advice is an opportunity, um, but but one that would that would 
really cost advisors to raise their games. You know, people will say things like robo advice are just essentially online tools and they don't really give advice and give financial planning and they're not really comparable with what we offer. Um, well, there might be some truth in that and we know that, but the end client doesn't know that. And, and Vanguard is a, is, a, is a prime example of that in the US. So for 30 basis points, you can have proper risk profiling process, um, straight through to onboarding, um, a portfolio construction that is suitable for client, and you get to talk to a certified financial planner for 30 basis point right? Right, okay. uh, uh, so 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 this is good I think I think the opportunity is that um, some of the challenges that we have around just uh, right from onboarding clients straight through to um, you know portfolio construction I think we get to a point where hopefully technology does that the, yes. the, the, the technology does a, a bit of that and the advisor focuses on what they do best high contact trying to really understand the client and what the clients trying to to achieve and it might just be that they need to tweak um, the solution a little bit to get to all ultimately get there, but things like rebalancing portfolios that we spend huge amount of time doing, um, hum humongous amount of paper being sent out to client. You know, have you, have you opened open an account on a platform, <laughs> see how many, the deluge of paper that gets sent out to your client? Robo Advice cuts that out. So for me, Robo Advice isn't a threat to advisor. It just makes advisors become invincible. If we adopt it and it's... Um, uh, um, done well, I think it's an incredible opportunity. And if it's part of a total solution, so the robo advice might be something that you ask them to use for one area of your your, your business. Um, it might be again, you know, ISIS season. You want to just quickly process some business that way. But when you come to do your annual review, you actually still want face to face yeah. type, type contact. But all running off the same joined up processes and joined up data, so that we can see a single uh, view of this this client experience. So I think it, 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 for some it will be the entire experience, um, okay. particularly lower yeah. down the market. But I think uh, we should, for, for many advisors, it will be part of what they do, not a replacement for what they do. Okay. I think that's Chris. right. Yes, and you know, I think I think you know we've seen and we've been talking about you know the rise of technology. That that is not going to suddenly stop. So yes, as we go further forward, I expect the, the pace of change to to accelerate, if if anything. So yes, the process the, the will actually get a lot simpler and a lot quicker. I mean, things like filling in you know uh, fact finds, mm. spend a lot of time doing that. It won't be too long, I would imagine, before our data is all held centrally stored, etc. And sure. that can be automatically fed through. So I think that the processes themselves will get a lot quicker, a lot more streamlined. And will we start to give simple advice in simple areas for customers, you know, of, of less complicated needs? I'm sure we will. And as you quite rightly say, the opportunity is for advisors to become part of that journey and to create that holistic uh, overall service so that, yeah, you can deal with your own ISA this year, et cetera, and et cetera. But when you want to talk about longer-term complex financial planning or inheritance tax, then that's available. And I don't have to re-key and tell you everything all again. It's all there already for me. So I, it's a mix. Yeah, I, I, the interesting thing I saw on, on Twitter the other day was, um, you know, someone says, um, you know, I need a portfolio. I need a portfolio for, for my for my for my for my investment. You know, robot advice says here it is. And someone goes, um, I'm thinking of divorcing my wife. Mm -hmm. Robo advice is says, oh, yeah. you know, do, you know, so so it's the yeah. complex, it's the complex areas that that the te that, te that 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 is based on human emotions and and all the complicated things going on in our life. Someone's going to you know to to into care and they need planning, um, so we can focus on you know um, planning, right? Yeah. And that's what robo advice is. gets us to the point where we can fo focus on on planning rather than chasing paper and data and yeah. mm -hmm. and chasing yeah. our tills basically. It's all the admin side. So um, we do actually have another slide um, just quickly um, on it may already be live on your on your screens. 
um, which is looking at the robo advice market in the US. Why am I showing you the US market? It's no relevant. I kind of take that point. But um, it does go to show the size of the, I mean, one of the, the financial engines, 104 um, billion um, assets. Obviously, maybe not quite so impressive in the, in the US market as that would be here. But um, it does go to show the interest uh, in the market over there. Now, there's a difference, isn't there, between some of these um, robo advice models that do employ a hybrid of a bit of advisor, a bit of um, mm. electronics. Mm. Um, but do you, Mark, um, do you ever envisage a time when we may be able to make a similar slide as this for the UK in the next 20 years or so? Uh, well, next 20 years, definitely. And I think it'll depend what part of the market you look at. So you can see certain areas like Worksite where the sort of uh, activity is going to absolutely take off uh, a, a lot quicker. Um, uh, but I, I, again, I think some of those hybrid models will then gain momentum. I, I think what will be interesting is how some of the big brands, so some the bigger organizations come in and adopt this mm. um, and um, you know will, will it be the banks will it be building societies will it be brands that have nothing to do with financial services sure, at the moment sure. that come in here uh, that can have the money to invest in this area okay right would anybody like to add anything at all to the idea of there being a large robo advice presence in the UK over the next decade I said 20 years but it seems that it would be sooner in Mark's opinion I, 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 yes I share, share the view I, th I think it's, it's it's almost inevitable for a certain segment of, of the market I think it absolutely will appeal I think you're quite right you know there are some interesting pricing um, models in there which mean it will be you know cheaper and I think it would probably actually conversely it might appeal to the people who actually know what they're doing um, who are saying well actually I just really wanted to delegate this task I could have done it myself I could have set a portfolio and if there's a tool and a way of doing it really cheaply and quickly, I'm very happy with that. Does it address the market that actually wants some real genuine help? Mm. As you quite rightly said, maybe not. I think maybe there's different solutions in that particular area. So can I see it happening? Yes, ab absolutely I can. Will it be for everybody? Absolutely not. It's working out that business proposition. I think that's what um, each firm has to do is how they're going to use it. Is it yep. to attack the mass market that they currently can't afford to do it? Is it a value-added service for their high net worth clients that want more instant service? in some, some instances, um, you know, just getting that balance right uh, of where it fits into your overall business proposition. Or as, as you say, for individual clients, it's perhaps part and part, you know, it's the same for, yeah. for this, you want face to face and for that you're going to have, you can do it on your own and you can mix and match. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, before we go, I did mention at the beginning about CPD. I meant to mention it earlier, I apologize. But if you would like to claim your CPD credits for this uh, live event, you can send us your details by via the Ask a Question tab on the website. If you click Ask a Question and just send us your name and uh, email address, we can be in touch to ensure that you get that accreditation. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this um, live debate on advisor technology. Thank you to Chris, Abraham, and Mark for joining us. And we hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.